Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, today, we're going to present a concept that we call the extreme availability, or simply XA. Um, we're going to see a lot of services. Uh, we're going to see a lot of architectures based on mainly on EC2, ELB, uh, Elastic Beanstalk, RDS, DynamoDB, uh, and Route 53. Uh, it's a lot of services, so we won't have time to dive deep on all of them. But we'll provide some architecture guidance for you to starting achieving XA using these services. And by the way, I am Eduardo Horai. I manage the AWS Solutions architect Architecture team in Latin America. I'm based out of Sao Paulo. And my name is Raul Frias. I'm a Solutions archi Architect also for AWS. I'm based in Mexico City. So and my name is Andrea Fatala. I'm a CDO, a Chief Digital Officer of Magazine Luisa. And I'm here to tell you guys how we migrate the, our e-commerce platform to the AWS using the best practice of XA. And let's quickly walk through the agenda for today. First, I'm going to introduce the concept of extreme availability and why you should consider it. Then I'm going to present some basic tenets for you to start achieving XA. Then we're going to dive deep a little bit more in each of your most common application layers and how you can achieve XA on them. And finally, we're going to close up with some final thoughts. And you know, we, we all know what SLAs are. We all care about our application SLAs, our infrastructure SLAs. They are all very important. But if you have a, a, a failure, you have a problem, and suddenly your website is down, the SLAs, they won't do a thing for you. And suddenly, a lot of bad things can happen. Uh, you see people tweeting about your, your company saying bad things. Your company might lo lo lose a lot, of, a lot of money, financial problems. Uh, or your customer, your branding can, can start being affected. And like our CTO, Werner Vogels, always says, everything fails all the time, and that's really true. Um, if you think about it, your application is in danger of suffering a failure or a catastrophic thing all the time. And what happens is suddenly your, your users, by the way, who has never seen those errors before? You know, it, Everybody has seen those. We'll be back soon. Sorry, the website's unavailable. Or simply, um, oops, you know. You, you see all these 500 errors codes, which oh, are terrible. I've seen a lot of this. Really? So what happened? So actually, I have some examples that are pre-cloud area in Magazine Luisa. But before that, I just want to talk a little bit about Magazine Luisa. So first, Magazine is not a paper. It's just an old and fashioned way that we call stores in Portuguese. And uh, Magazine Luiza is one of the top retail chains in Brazil. And we operate more than 700 brick and mortar stores in 16 states. And uh, we have eight distribution centers and a strong multi-channel strategy. That's why we have a commerce operation too. So, I don't know if you guys are familiar about uh, Brazil. Brazil is a pretty big country. We have more than 200 million people living there, and uh, Brazilians love to shop. shop. And uh, that's why we just copped the Black Friday for US, and the first edition happened in 2012 in Brazil. And uh, so I have to tell you guys, we didn't do a great job. Here we have a user complain about our sales in the social media. And uh, a lot of e-commerce actually went down in the first hours of Black Friday in 2012. Another good example is uh, a campaign called Liquidação Fantástica. It's a, a huge clearance sales that happens in the beginning of the year in Brazil. And Magazine Luiza is uh, really traditional about this. The, the sales start like 20 years ago. And uh, 10 years ago, we started uh, running this, this campaign in the internet, too. So I think that Horai can just, just give some pictures about what happens in this campaign in Brazil. Yeah, I think if you imagine here in the US, when you have, a, let's say, a large consumer electronic company that starts selling new products like mobile phones and so on, and you see those huge queues, I think that's, that's huge queues. They happen in Magazine Luiza, but probably about 10 times worse, and then everybody 
doesn't really kill. They just stuck in front of the door. And whenever the doors open, everybody just run, crash the door, and grab everything they can. Because literally, whatever you grab, you, can, you go there and pay with 70% of discounts. So it's, it's really huge. And uh, in respect of these guys that just sleep in the front of the stores, we just closed the, web the website one day before. And uh, we open after some hours that this clears, clears sales uh, it starts in the, the physical stores. And uh, in 2012, I have the same example. I think you guys can guess what happened. Here you have another easy complaint in the social media that we have uh, good products, good price, but the website went down again. So, and uh, it's not uh, a really huge negative impact for our branding, but also for our revenue. Because nowadays, in, in sales like this, we reach a peaks of 120 orders per minute. So you can imagine if you stay like a, an hour off on, on this kind of campaign. And to help you to protect from all these problems, uh, I want to present you the concept of extreme availability. And this will take your application to the next level of availability going beyond the traditional high, availab high availability concept that we are all used to it. And wh when we think about XA, you should, you should think about XA everywhere, in every service, every application layer, every storage, literally everything, um, even services that you don't own it. Because it doesn't matter how much time and effort you put into your application, if you leave one single component and that fails, your whole website will go down, and your whole reputation, everything will just fail, no matter how much hard you work you have done. I think, I think Andrea has a, knows a little bit more about this, right? Yeah, so here again, as a bad example guy, I promised it the last one. And uh, here uh, we have an example of how a small failure can impact the entire application. Uh, in, the, in the past, we just launched a, a version of our e-commerce application with a bug. Uh, not our will, and uh, after some time, our application does start getting crazy. And uh, as you guys can see in this graph, it took like almost five hours to analyze and identify and send a bug fix to our application. And it's a it, what happens is a really tiny thing on our cache layer, and uh, this impact is really, really bad for us. I heard you were local. You were caching locally, is that true? Yeah, I don't know why some genius guys decide to, to develop a, a local cache layer. In Java? In Java, okay. yeah. Just to be clear. <laughs> um, and after all those bad stories, I, I'm sure we'll stop with them. Uh, or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to present some basic tenets for you to start achieving extreme availability. And the first one, AWS has a global infrastructure. 11 regions around the world, and you should leverage them. You should start using them. They are there for you, right? Uh, so think about serving part of your application or part of your traffic to a different region instead of ha having everything in just one, in one single location. So leverage our global presence. And we just launched a uh, Frankfurt region two weeks ago. It's not there in the map yet, but it's a total of 11 regions. Second. Please consider extreme availability in the beginning, not in the end, right? In the beginning, you have time. You'll be thinking the best way to architect, to design your application. You have more time, more flexibility. And that's when you can best think the best way to achieve XA. And third, XA is not only about technical. It impacts everything. It impacts how your developers do their stuff. It impacts your people. It impacts how you're testing. It impacts how you're collecting your requirements. So, Think about XA literally everywhere. And, and this is very, very important. You know, be prepared for failures. <laughs> failures will come for sure, like we say in Brazil. Failures are just like tax and death. You are sure that they will come. So you need, you need, to, be prepared, you need to be prepared for them, not for the death, but maybe for the failures. Uh, so think about the most common failures that happen, application failure, infrastructure failure, failure your website, your web server going down, or your database failing. Those are very common ones that you should be prepared for them. And there are, there are also ones that are very, very hard to diagnose. Who has never had a, suddenly a high latency in the network? 
and took hours to find out what was the reason. So think about also these strange ones, like network problems, or even the very rare and, and unexpected ones, like cascade capacity failure, which happens when your pr primary service fails, your secondary gets the full load, but doesn't have the capacity to attain all the requests, so end up failing as well. So think about every type of failure that can happen and how you can protect from them. And as part of that, you should think about graceful failure of each service. And what that really means that, for example, if your primary service fails, a very complex service fails, you should think about having maybe a simpler version of that service that maybe provides static information or a, a more simple, simpler algorithm. So you don't need to provide 100% accurate information to the user, but you need to provide something so the user doesn't see all those ugly error messages. And to help you on that as well, you should think about microservice-oriented architecture. And what that, that means is that we are evolving the concept of service-oriented architecture. We are taking each service and break it down into smaller independent units that are self-contained. And if they fail, it's just a small portion that fail, and all the other services can maybe call a second tier service instead of calling the service which, which fail. So that will help you to achieve extreme availability. And last, and very important, uh, architect your availability according to what your business needs, not what we want. Because we always want more, we are IT guys, we want to build cool stuff, you know. But think about what your business need, really need, because there's clearly a trade-off. Every nine more of, of availability that you seek, uh, you increase costs and you increase complexity. So think about what you really need and starting getting from them, from there. XA is not for every service or for every type of workload. Even high availability is not. So think where is the best place or the best time to start thinking about XA. Thanks, Will. So uh, with all these principles and tenets in mind, uh, how can AWS help you? Um, we want to talk to you how you can build XA into your different layers of your, or of your typical web application or your applications in AWS. And um, we'll start first with the front end layer. And afterwards, we're going to talk about a little bit more in the information layer. So what do we have usually uh, as a highly available web application in AWS? So we, we use a variety of uh, services from the user perspective. You have Amazon Route 53 for managing your DNS requests. You uh, configure health checks, and you configure the, the primary and a secondary failover uh, record set. A secondary to the Amazon S3 static website, which is a very cool feature. Nobody, uh, not, not many people know uh, how to use it. It's pretty easy to use. Um, going into the region level, you might have an elastic load balancer, an ELB, with cross-zone enabled, uh, auto, your auto scaling group, using a multi-AC architecture with EC2 instances. And uh, this is only one region. Uh, as stated before by Eduardo, uh, some of you might need to scale this to an extreme level using a multi-region deployment. And uh, so let's raise the bar a little. Let's raise the bar to XA. This is the AWS way. And uh, here we have it, extreme available architecture in AWS. And I want to say one thing. Route 53 rocks. Why? Here we have a multi-region deployment with AWS, and Route 53 is our core enabler here. We're using uh, latency-based routing in this case. We could also use any of the other options that Route 53 has for us, like geo-based routing or weighted round robin. Um, differences, response time, user location, or a, more ba or a balanced ratio between the regions that you might want to consider for, for your deployment. And uh, why, why Route 53 is so cool? Well, it's not only it's super cheap, it's very easy to use. Its propagation time is very low. It's below one minute. And uh, we just recently launched last week or a couple of weeks ago the private DNS feature for our, uh, Route 53 inside B VPCs. And uh, also, the integration with AWS resources is super easy to use uh, through the alias record sets. So, as an example, we wanted to show you what would happen uh, in the case of a region failure. Um, basically, what would happen, if we don't care about the reason why that happened, Route 53 will handle all the traffic 
and handle all of the situation. All kinds of, if you have your health checks configured, you, you will have all alarms and notifications being sent. But Route 53 will start, re re will start redirecting all your traffic to your uh, healthy region. And uh, basically, uh, we're back to an HA, right? We're, we're back to a uh, uh, multi-AC deployment, which is still pretty good. And um, uh, just to clarify for some of you that might not know, in a multi-AC architecture, our, our availability zones are separated by a very uh, considerable distance in kilometers. We're able to sustain fires, floods in the region. And uh, so that's, that's still pretty good. And uh, just another idea that we want to share with you, with you. Not many users know this, but I deliberately didn't mention anything about content distribution. But we could also use CloudFront for our static and dynamic content, content acceleration. And uh, using the very same extremely available architecture as mentioned before, also CloudFront could benefit from this architecture as having our origin, multi handle multiple origins, and having the pop location or the edge location fetch the origin content from the fastest region. Right? So for example, a user, uh, uh, a request from the East Coast ideally will fetch their content from the US East region, for example. So how do we get there? Uh, how can you guys do this? As Eduardo mentioned before, in the third tenet, this is not only about technology, this is also about people and processes. And uh, there, may, there may be many ways you can do this. We thought of a couple of examples. Andres is going to talk about, uh, talked about uh, a little bit how he's doing it. And uh, first, one example that we thought about you could use very fast, AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, very easy to use. You, basic, you can basically deploy your application in multiple regions. And uh, once you have your application deployed with Elastic Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk will create your URL with, from Route 53. And then you, you create nested record sets with latency-based routing or geo-based routing, uh, wh whatever routing policy you want. And, uh, you, you, might have, you might accomplish this front-end extremely available architecture. Another idea we had, uh, the multi-region AMI strategy, very basic, only using AWS tools. Basically, you have an AMI on your uh, origin on the one region. You copy this AMI to another region. And once you have this uh, process that we have, we have since one year ago, I think, uh, you can create a new launch configuration with a new AMI. You can have your auto scaling group live uh, updated with a new launch configuration. And then you can wait for the scale up policy to execute automatically, or you can just execute it ma uh, manually. Um, so, for this, uh, I just want to show you a quick demo of how you might do this. Uh, can you help me, guys? Switch? Thank you. Uh, that was pretty fast. <laughs> uh, so, I'm just going to follow some IAM best practices here. Uh, here's my AWS console login page for my IAM account. I'm going to use my IAM user. And I have enabled my uh, soft token for multi-factor authentication here. So here it is. And uh, OK. So I'm going to go here. This is the AWS console inside Elastic Beanstalk. This is what we have basically done. I have, a, I have made a, an application based in with uh, .NET. I know there's some of you guys still programming in Visual Studio. We have a toolkit, very, uh, very easy to use. It integrates pretty cool. And uh, so here's the dashboard for Elastic Beanstalk. You can see the health status, which version I'm running of my application, the, the configuration hardware that it's running in, in this case, uh, Windows Server 2012. I don't need to care about that in Elastic Beanstalk. The recent events, and uh, also, there's some default configurations in Elastic Beanstalk. You can modify this, um, like the number of uh, scaling, uh, number of instances, instances in your auto scaling group, which policy you are using to scale in and scale out, instance types, uh, uh, Elastic Load Balancer uh, configuration, etc. So, this is a URL that the Elastic Beanstalk has uh, done for me, and this is basically the application. It's very simple. I'm just showing, in this case, which region the, the application is running on. And I'm using an RDS database with a movie, uh, movie database 
uh, on the back end based on RDS. And uh, so we have here uh, a couple of movies. These guys chose the movies, so don't judge. Uh, just to show you that we're using the same application in another region, I'm just going to create another one, which is ARC 3111 today, right? Which is tech, right? And pretty cheap. OK, so here it is. And I'm going to go basically to a, we were running in US East region. I'm going to change my region to the US West. I have deployed the very same application over here. So I just go to the new or to the other URL, and I will show you. It's US West, and it's here's the same movie, right? So now we have uh, the same application running in two uh, different regions. They're synchronized with the same information. And um, I want to simulate a region failure, right? So there's some customers that have asked us, like, how, how can we do this? Uh, so in this case, what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to uh, modify the security group that it's associated with my load balancer, and I'm going to block traffic. What this will do? Raul, why don't you show Route 53 before? So show how we can configure Route 53. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Raul. Route 53. That's right. OK, we had our, our both URLs, and I have created my domain here. And uh, I have an xarchitecture.info. And I'm going to filter here. I don't know if you can see this. OK. I created two record sets that point to different regions, one that it's pointing to the east region, and the other one that it's pointing to the west region. I'm using latency-based. So, uh, and also, I have a health check associated with all these record sets. Um, I'm going to test it now. I'm going to close these two windows. I'm going to test and see which one, based on the latency, which region a uh, answers here in at Rainband. So basically, we have US West answering with the best latency here. right? And uh, now I'm going to simulate the region failure. So I'm going to go to, to EC2 to my security group in the West region, which we're there. And the Elastic Beanstalk has created a couple of uh, security groups here. Yeah, it's in US West. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I believe this is it. No, here it is the load balancer security group. I'll just. So it's open. I'm just practically deleting this. So what will happen here? Um, basically, the health checks that I have in Route 53, which are right here, I'm going to show them to you, will start failing. And um, so I have configured two health checks, one for the west region and another for the east region. The request interval for Route 53, the least that you can put it is in ten, for 10 seconds and, the, uh, and a failure threshold of one. So. Um, the metrics here, you can see the state of one, it's up and healthy, zero, uh, it's uh, off. This is CloudWatch, so it might take a minute, a whole minute for the graph to refresh, but more than 10 seconds have, have passed, so I'm just uh, refreshing the same URL. And uh, hopefully, this should be changing now. Hold on, I'm going to close it and open up so it refreshes again, X arc. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, this is a live demo. You know how this is. So now US East has answered, right? So we, have a, we had a very quick failover to the other region. And uh, I'm going to switch back. Can you help us, uh, help me here to switch to the other screen? Can you help me here, please? Switch to the presentation. Switch to the other computer. Yeah. There we go. So, uh, Andre, have, we have here a big picture. Uh, can you explain us how you're doing your front end, extremely yes. available multi-region architecture? Of course. So when you decide to migrate the, the e-commerce platform to AWS, we, we just uh, follow all the best practices of extreme availability, too. And uh, we decide to run our application in multi-region 
in an active and passive way. And uh, with that, we maintain the, the entire traffic of our, our, our website in the South America. When we have uh, huge sales, as I talked before, we just switch the modes to active, active. So we can just spread the traffic between the both regions, uh, the South America East and US East. And uh, we have this strange guy here, the Vernish Cash, that does a really good job with us to routing the traffic to our mobile application. And we also use this, this Vernish routing to test some new versions of our application. We can just isolate the, the, this version and send a, Porsche, a portion of the traffic to this, this new version that we want to test. And um, with that, we can handle a lot of uh, traffic when you have this kind of uh, huge sales in Brazil. Oh, and um, which routing policy are you using in Route 53? So we decided to wait on how the policy, because with that, we can split the traffic and uh, it helped us in the last year in the, in the two, uh, 2013 Black Friday edition because we actually send the, the, the most part of our traffic to US East and launch more than 100 instances here. And uh, wow. it's, it's uh, really good also to reduce uh, investments because the instance is cheaper here than in South America. Right. And um, how are you handling the challenge of having your versions and your configurations with the same version in different uh, regions? So use a puppet to handle this configuration and we just push the chains to the both regions uh, from using a central repository. Wow, great. Yeah, that's great architecture, thank you, Andre. And now let's move to the information layer. And first I want to clarify something. Uh, here, normally a lot of people would call it data database layer, but if you think through it nowadays, this layer doesn't contain only your relational database, but it contains also your non-relational database, it contains your cache, it contains log files, and co contains configuration files. So it contains a bunch of stuff that all in all they store information. So we are calling here information layer. And starting with a high available environment in AWS, if you're using Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS, it's very simple. You just turn the multi-AZ flag on, and what that does is it creates a standby replica in the other AZ within the same region. And if the master database fails, the standby replica is promoted to master and assumes everything from there. So it's, it's very simple to, to have it. If you're using DynamoDB or S3, they have built-in built in HA uh, at the region level. But we're not happy with all that. We want to raise the bar to XA. That's how AWS likes to do this. We do that all the time. And to do that, I would like to say, like Raul says always, uh, Amazon RDS read Hapkas rocks. Why the rock? Because with, with this feature, you can very easily create a read Hapka in a second region far away. Or even going further, further, you can create a replica of a replica. So you can have other replicas in other AZs in the secondary region. So that's a very powerful mechanism. So you have your whole information, your whole dat database uh, synchronized in at least two different regions. And in case your master database fails or that entire Z fails, uh, the failover moves the standby to become the new master. That's simple. But going a, a failure further, let's say like this, uh, if even this, the second master fails, you can promote one of the read replicas to become the new master. And then the other replicas will start being replicated from this new master. So this is a very powerful mechanism. Even if all your application in one entire Z fails, you still have your whole information, and your application can still be writing and reading from this new promoted master. You can also use third-party tools uh, like Golden Gate if you're using RDS Oracle, or Attunity for RDS Oracle, SQL Server, or MySQL. But the concept is the same. Uh, you can replicate your information from, two database, from one database to the other database in, in another region. And if you're using DynamoDB, uh, this week we launched a new feature called DynamoDB Streams. And I will show you later how this feature will help. Other ways you can achieve extreme availability in DynamoDB, you can run AWS Data Pipeline and copy the data from uh, one, region, one table in one region to the other table in another region from time to time. 
or you can create your own solution, replicating the information or writing twice in database. There are different ways to do that. And if you're using any other NoSQL database like Mongo, Cassandra, and so on, most of them they have an asynchronous replication which you can turn uh, in two different regions. Of course, that's there is a little bit more hard. It's a little bit harder. You need to manage the configuration, manage the failure, and so on. And let let's see how this DynamoDB streams works. So basically, you have your web application or your application reading and writing to DynamoDB, to DynamoDB table. If you activate the streams, what will that do is it, every write operation to a, a DynamoDB table will be logged into a stream in a strictly ordered and unique way. And reading from that stream, consuming from there, you can create your own application and, for example, populate another DynamoDB in another region. Yeah? So that's a very, very powerful mechanism so you can have a multi-region replication. Or if you want to get one step further, you can even have a multi-master replication or a multi-master strategy. You can have your two DynamoDB tables being the masters and whatever there your application you create, that application can manage any conflict and everything. So it's a very powerful mechanism. And as part of the launch, we are open sourcing uh, a library that will facilitate you to start to write that replication application. Let's just li look a little bit inside what does that application looks like. Um, so first, as part of, of the new API, uh, we have a DynamoDB Streams client, and that will be used to, co to connect uh, into the, the streams. You also have a DynamoDB client, as usual, for those used with our API and our SDKs, and that will be used to, cons to connect to the secondary uh, DynamoDB table in the second region. And here, uh, as the DynamoDB streams and the Kinesis stream, they're very similar. We can, sh we can use the same Kinesis client library, the KCL, or you can use even the, the DynamoDB update streams uh, API. So you can use the KCL to connect to the DynamoDB streams. And here we are, we are passing all the parameters. We are fetching maximum of 100 records at a time. Um, we are creating a worker, a Kinesis worker, passing our factory, which I'll show you later, and starting a new thread that will be consuming from, from the stream. And here, once we have all the information in the streaming, we are consuming from the stream, as I showed before, and now we are going to start processing all the information which we are fetching, all the log which we are fetching. And for that, we created this record processor, which uh, implements one of the interface of the Kinesis to process the information. That has one, one of the methods is to, is to process that information. And basically, you receive a list of logs, chains, in an ordered way, as I said before. And we are going to iterate over that list, taking each item, getting the object that is inside. And depending on the type of event, if it's an insert or modify, we'll take that content and call DynamoDB utility to put that same item into the secondary region. And same wise, if, if it were a delete event, uh, we would call the helper uh, to delete that item from the DynamoDB table. So in that way, you have the two DynamoDB tables synchronized, same information, just using this feature called DynamoDB streams. If you're using S3, and in case you don't have a lot of objects, uh, you can easily synchronize the content between, between two buckets with a very, very simple command line call. It's as simple as that, right? There are other ways to do that as well. Uh, and the failover you have to manage on the client side. And Andre, can you tell us a little bit more how does Magazine Luisa handles the architecture in the information layer? Of course. So it, it was really tricky for us because, as I said before, we are a multi channel strategy company. So uh, with that, we just share the backoffs between the online and offline operation. And that brings a new challenge for us, sure. an interest challenge for us. One of those is that the, all the 700 plus stores are physically connected to our legacy data center. And uh, there, every, where we have our ERP database of all the products information, like price, uh, inventory, and so on. And, uh, 
our e-commerce platform is running on top of AWS. So what we did, actually, uh, in this ima image, you guys can see uh, an overview of a hybrid strategy to use cloud. We have this collocation with our ERP database and the AWS. So we did a direct connect between them. And uh, we just launched some video replicas of a SQL server in the AWS. And uh, we started doing replication data between this, th those uh, databases. And uh, with that, we, we just used the same approach to replicate data to US2, but via a VPN. OK, that's interesting. Uh, but I see that that connection between the legacy, data, the legacy data center and AWS in both regions, they're very important because of your application. Yes. Uh, so what happens in, in the case that there's suddenly an increase of latency or worse if that connection just breaks and everything goes down? So actually, it's not a problem for us because when we have this problem with connectivity, uh, we just developed an architecture a solution to send all the orders to uh, Amazon SQS and we have uh, workers to consume this, this message. So when we have the connectivity established again, we just can consume the message and send the order to our ERP database. OK, that's cool. And I'm looking to the picture, and I see that you have uh, some NoSQL database. I guess you handle the shopping cart information. How do you handle the synchronization between the shopping cart in the two AWS regions? So uh, the MongoDB is our solution for NoSQL. And uh, it handles all the checkout flow. And uh, we just launched the replica set in the both regions to maintain the replication of the data. And we have arbiters to decide who's the master node. And with that, we can persist the, the customer cards. Oh, that's great. And when are you thinking about moving that to DynamoDB? I actually have this in the roadmap. OK, I'm looking forward to see that. That's, that's a, I think that's a great user case and an awesome architecture. I'm sure a lot of customers will want to talk with you later. So just to wrap up, guys, I think the key message today was really that you can achieve uh, an availability beyond the traditional high availability concept. Uh, and when you start doing that, remember our basic tenants. So remember to be leveraged AWS global infrastructure. Uh, consider exceeding the beginning of your process, not only in the end. Remember it's not only a technical change, and very important, be prepared for every type of failure. And to help you on that, thinking about graceful failure and to implement a microservice-oriented architecture. And the most important, nowadays, you can architect your availability according to what your business needs. Yeah? So the, the availability is just another component that you should think in your architecture. So think about the best way to achieve what your business will need. So thank you guys for your time. I hope you enjoyed the talk today. And I hope you can start to use some of these XA concepts. Thank you. Thank you.